Hello, I'm horror cartoonist Dennis St. John. I draw monsters and write twisted tales. As you can imagine, I was a little obsessed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Lucky for me, so were most of my high school friends, all except one. One friend who stubbornly refused to join the Scoobies. So here we all are, 20 some odd years later. I'm teaming up with Doc Travis, John, Teach Landis, and maybe a special guest or two, and we are going to make our friend, Michael Poli, watch one episode of Buffy a week until he's no longer the Buffy Virgin. Welcome to Angel Virgin, usually a spoiler-free Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast, but we're back from Pylea, and we're just trying to get our lives back in order. We're watching Angel Season 3, Episodes 1 through 7. Uh, make sure to subscribe to hear all of the Buffy and Angel content and give us a rating. I'm your host, cartoonist Dennis St. John, and I want the rest of you guys introduce yourselves with how much Bones you've watched. I'm Travis. I've watched almost every episode of Bones. Uh, yes, yes, he's shaming me now for that. Thank you. Thank you, cartoonist. Cartoonists can be mean people. That's true. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is John, and sometimes I just sit and watch The Bones for hours. But uh, I have uh, only ever once tried to watch that David Boreanaz show. I didn't like it very much. My name is Michael. I'm the Angel Virgin, and I get to see Bones every time I go to 24 Hour Fitness, when, I, when we used to go to 24 Hour Fitness. Uh, and I would be delighted to see David Boreanaz on the television in the treadmill room. Thank you, guys. The most just, important thing about television is David Boreanaz should always be on it. Michael just wants to clarify, he's not a Bones virgin, so don't get any ideas. <laughs> please, yeah, please don't. Well, my, my wife watched all of Bones at one time, so I have seen Bones before. <laughs> that could be a the, podcast. Uh, yeah. I'm the Bones virgin. I've seen like two episodes. I've seen many episodes because it was one of my mom's favorite shows, so I'd watch it so I could talk to her about it. I, look, I don't want to exploit anyone else's virginity, okay? I know it's an exploitable weakness. <laughs> you have no idea who the better Dave Chanel sister is. <laughs> it's Emily. We all know. <laughs> all right. Uh, so before we get into uh, seven episodes of Angel, we're going to do reactions from the last time we watched seven episodes of Angel, and that was Angel Season 2, Part 3. Audience Reactions Our first reaction comes from a new commenter, uh, Travis Morrison McCall. Uh, and John, why don't you read what Travis has to say? Travis says, This episode needs to have a disclaimer at the beginning. Warning, this video may cause intense cravings for tacos. Now I need to go buy some tacos. You forgot the second part, my friend. Oh, I didn't realize that was part of the same thing. <laughs> and I did. I, ma I made that comment, and I went and I bought tacos. Oh, Not man. from Taco Bell, um, <laughs> but from a real taco place. Yes, real taqueria. Uh, and our old pal, uh, Garrett Thatcher, says, um, What's John talking about? You can get tacos in the, in the UK. You just go down to the local supermarket and get a taco kit. There's loads. Uh, this has nothing to do with Angel, but hearing you talk about TNG makes me uh, want to listen to a Deep Space Nine Virgins podcast. And then in parentheses, it's a better, more cohesive show than TNG before you ask. Uh, so there's a lot, Garrett. Thank you so much for uh, writing us. There's a lot to unpack in those two sentences. Yes, there is. Uh, I'm Garrett, we cannot, we cannot get down that road of a Deep Space Nine podcast. <laughs> you, you don't understand what forces you're unleashing with that sort of comment, Garrett. Uh, but first, let's ha let's have John uh, uh, direct this taco kit comment. Well, I mean, I think you guys can understand the the quality of like taco ingredients that you get from an aisle in a grocery store here is the same as or worse as what you would get in an aisle in a regular grocery store in America, which is not great, right? You know, the like the um, the old El Paso brand stuff. Uh, bready tortillas and uh, really mild and gross canned salsa. It's not a good situation. Uh, only here it costs like twice as much. But I did find a Mexican grocer Ooh, in dude. London who delivers during the uh, pandemic situation. So we got uh, a massive box of uh, flour tortillas, uh, 
three giant bags of masa harina so I can make my own corn tortillas. Wow, uh, dude. Six cans of uh, uh, refried beans, a massive, one of the big industrial cans of tomatillos, uh, some adobe uh, uh, peppers. Like I'm, uh, I'm actually doing okay. Dude, I'm very happy for you. Yeah. yeah. Anyone who just watches our angel cast will know uh, the struggles that John has had with tacos. This is amazing. What a happy story. <laughs> I thought this was going to go a completely different direction. I actually, uh, I've made, you know how during quarantine, your food that you make for yourself becomes like too extremely your food. <laughs> <laughs> I made tacos for lunch last night that were eggs and anchovies. And I love them. But then I was like, this is too much. Like, I'm way too far down the dentist rabbit hole. Eggs and anchovies. <laughs> and my couch still smells like anchovies. It's like... <laughs> wait, 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 What? That's too much information. <laughs> Just because it's found... fragrant fish, man. Oh, fragrant. Okay. <laughs> well, I thought you were, like, sitting on your couch, and now it smells like anchovies. I was like, whoa. Dude, you can only do that if you live alone, because, like... I have I've made this kind of anchovy Asian salad rice thing that I really like, and if I open the fish, the canned fish, immediately, my wife's just like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can smell that. I, I've been making the the taco meat. I, I, so the Frontera, the Frontera bent brand tacos like sauce is what I really like. So I've been making a lot of like uh, taco se- like taco meat uh, seasoned, and then I put on rice or. Um, yeah, I usually eat it with rice. So I like, because I don't have any corn or flour tortillas around. I mean, I could get them, but it's just easier not to have them around because they go bad. But So yeah, outside of this taco, taqueria, I've been like kind of eating a lot of, you know, like kind of taco, the good part of the taco, the inner part. <laughs> Skip the shells. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for listening to our taco segment. Uh, God, now... This has been Taco Virgin. <laughs> if, if only, if only one. If of you us... could find someone that's never had a taco, and blow their mind. I feel like that would be really easy in London. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> I think there's even a bit in the American Office uh, about somebody from London not having had tacos. Um, so let's go into summaries for these seven episodes and find out what we're going to even talk about. The Summary Well, in Heartthrob, Angel takes on a vampire named James and confronts the nature of loving someone who is dead. In That Vision Thing, Wolfram and Hart blackmails Angel with an assault on Cordelia's psyche. The only way to save her? To rescue a mysterious man from a hell dimension. In That Old Gang of Mine, uh, this is the episode where we ask ourselves, are there any good monsters? And we learn why Gunn is never allowed back at Caritas. <laughs> when his old crew takes on the demons that run the place. In Carpe Noctum, Angel body swaps with a horny old man at a retirement home. <laughs> In Fredless, Winifred's family shows up at the hotel and we say goodbye to Winifred. Or do we? Uh, bug monsters assault Angel's hotel. Winifred shows up just in time to fight them. And in Billy, there's this guy named Billy, and if he touches you, you commit misogynistic violence. <laughs> and finally, in Offspring, Angel struggles with his relationship with the very pregnant Darla and learns that not only is he a dad, but there's something wrong with that baby. Nice. Thank you, Mike. All right, let's uh, move on to Great Lines. Great Lines. Uh, we had a lot to choose from. Um, I picked these silly ones uh this is from fred while she's still in kind of freddy crazy fred mode i've been forking with gun uh always a charmer and this is um a back and part of the back and forth uh between uh cordelia and wesley while they're making fun of angel and buffy and the angel and buffy tropes uh starts with wes i love you so much i almost forgot to brood kiss me (laughs) bite me (laughs) So, so good. So, so good. I really liked uh, Fred's mom uh, when she was like, uh, I mean, Rod has always had a thing for those disgusting alien movies with all that slime and the teeth. Ugh, he just can't get enough of them. 
Except for that last one they made. I think he dozed off. Uh, Excellent dig, <laughs> burn, 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 resurrection. <laughs> Like a little like side swipe at uh, Joss Whedon is excellent. I like one where Cordelia um, is just talking to Angel and she goes, um, I am Cordelia. I don't think I know. Okay. Like she's just uh, such a great Cordelia, like super confident line of like, I got my, I got my stuff together. Well, um, I was, you know, a little hesitant to watch all these episodes, but when I heard Cordelia say in Heartthrob, she says, I miss Pylea. I laughed out loud. That got me. That was so good. <laughs> All right, let's move on to questions. Questions for the group. Who asks all these questions? I don't know. They oh. come from the doc. Okay. <laughs> why Why doesn't everyone live in the hotel? That would be a more efficient system. It's because then we wouldn't have De- Ghost Dennis, the best character. Yeah, also, um, like, do you want to live at work? Ugh. It's free. Rent in L.A. is insane, and I only lived there for one month. Uh, <laughs> and I live for point. free at my, at my aunt's place. Are, are you happy that, Mike, are you happy that Cordelia references the Ring of Amara? Yeah, that made me joyful. I'm glad that they have not forgotten that there's this ring that allows you to go out into sunlight. Yeah. And, and be invincible. Yeah, that Angel can't have because he needs to brood more. I mean, he <laughs> should have just, uh, the fact they get rid of that is insane. How do you how do you all feel that the gang lets the old the old body jumping man have a massive heart attack at the end of the episode of Carpe Noctum? Like so, just just to refresh everyone's memory, they body jump and then he starts yelling at Angel and then he starts grabbing his chest and screaming and they all walk out and she says, "Dad's having a night." <laughs> and, and earlier in the episode, the doctor's like, "One more heart attack and you will die." Yeah, I like this doctor also that's just like, just quit having heart attacks. Yeah. <laughs> or actually, I think it was just like the, the caregiving nurse. I can't remember exactly, but I was like, like... I was just so happy that they got Angel's body back in the right body because that thing was dragging on so strangely. And the way that, uh, I guess, Marcus was exploiting Angel's body was so frustrating and annoying. I just like, I needed this done. I needed it over with. So I was kind of happy they got rid of him. This guy's, he would waste a young body. <laughs> <laughs> by by being an obnoxious guy hitting on women in clubs and I guess biting their faces. Like, he was just... It was kind of fun to see him explore his vampire powers, but that was like... That was it. It was like a pervert discovers he has secret powers is a kind yeah. of fun story. Like a peeping Tom or something, yeah. <laughs> it but, is interesting that, like, between this batch and, like, you know, uh, once more with feeling has people dancing so hard they catch fire. This guy like sexes so much that his body's like turned to goo different uh (laughs) different ways of burning out a body i guess (laughs) different results so so mike there has been one body swap buffy episode and now one uh, angel episode of, of a body swap any more body swaps you would like to predict or not I mean, it's an irresistible sci-fi trope. Um, I'll put that down in predictions. I think there needs well, think, to be at least... Think about it. Yeah. I'll think about it. Um, I'd like to see a Cordelia Buffy one. That would really oh, mess things up right now. That would be amazing. Um, do, you, do you guys feel that Fred's southern accent was more pronounced than her parents' <laughs> southern accent? Like in the... It, Fred's southern accent is more of a comedy southern accent than her parents, who are yeah. just sort of like playing... The, the actors are playing a little bit more realistically, I feel like. Yeah. I think the actress herself is literally from Texas. I think maybe... Is she? I, I, but anyways, her southern accent was way stronger than her parents. That's what it felt yeah, like. Yeah, maybe her time in Pilea, she just doubled down on her accent. She, <laughs> yeah. What do you think the chart that the gang have that explains Angel's history looks like? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good thought. I'd love to see that. That should be some like periphery material you can buy. What kind of chart would it be? Would it be a pie chart? Would it be a flow chart? Would it be a Gantt chart? <laughs> I feel like it would have to have like lines of like who dated who, who sired who. Um, yeah. And then it has extra pages that describe things. But like it is really confusing about Angel's history. I also like that just uh, um, Darla and Buffy fit so much of the same thing it is confusing like yeah. this blonde that he loved that's the love of his life yeah. that has died and come back <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's so amazing oh my god 
or how they know that something's wrong with him because he's making out with a brunette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a good. That, that was a good weird. gag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so this I I just noticed. So Cordelia is uh, at one point patching Angel up because she like she like does uh, Fred's wounds first, and then she's like, Angel, you're up for the uh, you know wound care and it's, it's nice you can kind of put off taking care of uh angel because he's a vampire he's not going to get an infection it's like all good do you ever wish travis that you were working on vampires like you wouldn't have to wash your hands like it'd just be easier right <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever do you ever wish for that do you ever, like do you ever fantasize like, about that it's like just practice at that point you're like gotta practice my stitches like, yeah, yeah i guess it can just be all like all cosmetic issues like oh i gotta make this look good um, <laughs> but then you gotta be like oh man once this person gets back to full strength they're just gonna take me out so you gotta be like, you always gotta be delaying something, like putting putting one thing off, like, oh no no no, we'll fix one more thing next week, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the tale, the, um, that that Arabian Nights tale, right, where you have to keep telling stories so you don't yeah. get murdered. <laughs> I feel like that uh, would come into play quite a lot. Oh, that's a lovely a vampire's tale, and yeah. uh, it's or a vampire's uh, doctor's tale. Yeah. When will you fix my arm? It's still off. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I also really liked uh, just Angel's excitement about that. I feel like it really shows like um, how much his character has changed since like we met him. Like he's not just all brood; he has some enjoyment in life, and it's like getting patched up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna ask me how would I feel if I sloughed off like slug like uh, like skin every month, <laughs> every month. <laughs> And he makes a weird comment where he's like, just like a woman. Oh, I know. And that was like, so Just part of the weird, like, oh, God. misogyny theme running through this batch of episodes. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Uh, let's do best and worst episodes. Uh, I'll start it off with, um, I vote for that old gang of mine for both best and worst. I really like this episode, but I feel like it's going to, uh, it's got its issues. I just like it for its, like monsters are can be good thing but it's got like it's got some problems um but i think it's a very interesting episode and um i vote for heartthrob for most forgettable because i have genuinely always confused this with this this episode with the season one episode with jeremy renner where it's like (laughs) angel's got an old vampire friend back in town who plans to kill him uh and i watching it this time though i was amused with i always assumed that um Darla and Angel had like sired these two, but the episode doesn't say it. So then I started to think about like they're just this weird couple they went on a double date with once. And the, <laughs> the couple kept being like, But we're in love. We're such a better couple than you because we're in love. And then Angel and Darla are like, Yeah, but we fuck. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Yeah, Angel has that hilarious comment, right? Where it's like, Yeah, you're in love. Well, yeah, he implies that if you, you have to not be in love with someone to do the dirty things they do. Yeah. I mean, it's oh, that's so funny. Um, Billy is my best and, and my worst episode. It's my best episode because it's the only one of these seven that's about anything, in a way. Uh, I mean, I guess uh, that old gang of mine is about something, but like you said, it has some weird problems. Um, but it's kind of the worst just because of like Wesley's insane dialogue when he goes crazy. <laughs> His whole like... Do you think you're better than me because you're connected to life? Because you bleed? Like, yeah. like that shit goes way off the rails. <laughs> it gets weird. Yeah, yes. Are we going to have a section where we just crack open like a little bit of... We'll get to it, I'm sure. For old gang and Billy. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we do need to. We need to. Just like crack the egg a little bit. So my, my best episode was, was Fredless. Um, and the reason I like that is because I like, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice, it's a great episode because it gives Fred the opportunity to leave, the character to leave, but she's like kind of heroic, you know, her time in Pylea has changed her and now she's, she's a lot more brave, I think, than maybe before she went to Pylea, but also like this idea of like what reality is and like reality is not just what you think reality is, like you, your reality is influenced by what other people see, like that's a whole really cool concept and, mm-hmm. and so I want, to, I want to explore that more. So that's why I like Fred List a lot. And it had a really cool monsters. Like the monsters were it, great. It's a cool, um, that episode's a cool bookend for whatever the uh, season four uh, or season five episode uh, with uh, Tara and her family. 
Like those oh, episodes make kind of cool bookends because like you've seen the whole like, oh, your birth family is actually abusive and this is your chosen family. We've like we've seen that. And so when you're watching this episode the whole time, you're like, oh, we know this one. Her family's evil. They're probably monsters. Uh, and there's little hints that they might be. And then uh, and then it turns out, oh, no, actually having a family is great. And there's that great scene where everybody's like, oh, it's kind of neat how she has parents. <laughs> yeah, that is really sweet. I really like like Fred's speech about like, Oh, if you guys see me, then it's real. Like that really affects me every time. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, good but, episode. But, but Fredless is really it's it's you know that one's like I still feel is pretty problematic with how well I think the first episodes are really problematic with how they depict Fred having PTSD or depression. Like I think that depiction is is very concerning. But um, my worst episode is Billy only. So, because it's kind of like it's really over the top and think and I guess we'll talk about Billy. My thing with Billy was like it should have been like a straight up horror episode, like a lot more horror. Like it's a weird it's like a weird switch halfway through and then it's kind of like supposed to be scary, but it's like it's not quite filmed like horror enough for me. Um if that makes any sense. But but Wesley does great prop work with the with the axe pushing open the doors. <laughs> Well, my best episode, I like that vision thing. I think because it's just a f- fun episode. Like, in terms of a Monster of the Week episode that I would rewatch, I would rewatch that one. I like the weird, um, you know, like psychic they bring in to torture Cordelia. I like Trip to the Hell Dimension. Like, I like the weirdness of this, and I love um, the the new kind of villain, Park, which I guess I get to talk about why I love him later. But, like, Gavin Park is really fun, and I really enjoy that character. So, that one's got a lot of good stuff going on, so I would rewatch it for sure. Um, and then the worst is Carpe Noctum because it feels like such a waste of an opportunity. Because I like okay, so I like the idea of a body swap so much, but it, then the body swap is just used by a horny old man for horny old man stuff. Like, I don't know. That seems like they could have done something more interesting with that. And then he's also like kind of grasping at random experiences, and like, I, I mean, I like. There's a moment when he's at Angel Investigates and he's like trying to figure out who his name, who the names of people are and like what they do there. And like he's kind of discovering as a vampire, like that stuff's all great. I'd like to lean in more to him trying to be Angel and trying to pull it off as opposed to his plan at the end is he has to go around and kill Angel, <laughs> like kill the Marcus body. Like, dude, just uh, just play act as Angel for another couple episodes. I would love that and see how, how they struggle with figuring that out. But uh, anyway, I was, I was sad because that could have been a lot more fun. All right, let's do uh, best and worst of monsters. All right, I'm going to start it off. Um, the bug demons from Fredless, I think, are both because um, they're so big and crazy. And I do love the way they look. And I love the stuff like running them over the bus. But it's so much like we just watched as a, some of us just watched Drifting Classroom. And it's so similar where it's like these bugs are great but they don't really totally work. So the camera has to do all this work to kind of hide like their movement and everything. There is kind of in, in this angel, not in drifting classroom. There is this one scene where we do get to see its walk cycle and it's actually like really good, but very like, it doesn't quite, you know, it wouldn't work all the time. And you could tell they, it's a lot of effort to make these things walk. Um, I assume it requires wires uh, as well as the people in the, inside the suit doing hard work but i think it's it's good but bad um and like if this was made like only a year later they would have been totally cg things you know uh and i like that their blood crystallizes um also gonna just not talk about his personality but just talk about the look of skip the demon uh because it is a wild look um he almost looks like like if geiger and like hieronymus bosch worked together to create like a humanoid demon thing um the way it's got like like skulls hidden throughout his like suit and everything is wild um totally don't believe angel could take down a creature like this so easily <laughs> but that's a tale for another time um and i also love the yarbney demon from that old gang of mine the like big chubby white leechy looking guy who lives in the sewers and just wants to drink his big gulp uh immediate, <laughs> immediate emotions for that character uh the fact that like while he's scared he says please is like so adorable uh really great look looks kind of like you know the 
uh, leech monster from X Files, but like plumped up. <laughs> uh, so that's mo- those are my monsters. What do you guys got? Um, I agree with everything you said, um, and uh, I think having the the cockroaches at the end of uh, Fredless was a little bit weird. Like, <laughs> it's they, funny they, that they are just straight up cockroaches. They're just straight up cockroaches, but okay, whatever. <laughs> But yeah, I agree with everything you said. Uh, Skip is the best, man. I love that whole scene in the Hell Dimension. I mean, it's fantastic. It's like this beautiful set. I mean, simple set design concept of what a Hell Dimension is like. It's so, the, the transition is great because, you know, Angel's preparing to take all these weapons with him and they can't travel with him. <laughs> and so you're like, oh shit, he's screwed. And then Skip is this really intimidating looking character that's like very, uh, very like generic office drone. But like in a hell dimension, and like I, that's so uh, that's so disarming. I immediately fall in love with Skip. He's like, yeah, the commute, you know, whatever. He's just talking about his life and stuff. And meanwhile, there's someone on fire screaming that Skip is somehow silenced. And like, I, I just love everything about that scene. And then ugh, the worst is probably Billy for me. Um, Billy's should be a more unsettling villain, but I, I don't know what is wrong with that villain in the way it's working. But it doesn't. The the challenge of Billy is that he touches you and then you you it exploits this misogynistic aspects of your personality or creates them and like it it just doesn't makes it doesn't make enough sense like he just kind of smiles at the can like he doesn't do enough evils there's not enough evil emanating from him as a character to make sense of that like there's this great confrontation where that should be an amazing confrontation when Angel breaks into Billy's house like his amazing you know political palace and like there's he like angel jumps the gate he gets up to the house and then he locks like he's being very sneaky and then he locks eyes with billy and then it's like sneaking's over smash the window let's it's like that confrontation setup is so good and then it just feels like it's so deflated because there's nothing the cops are there for a completely different reason they deflate this opportunity for a really good setup for a confrontation later and they drop it they really drop the ball there and i'm so and Billy could have been a lot bigger and more interesting. So I, that made him the worst monster. Uh, let's do best and worst of celebrity cameos. And I don't think there's any worst. Let's just call out some celebrity cameos. Uh, the biggest I noticed was uh, Cal Penn as the psychic with a fez. Uh, we got to see his brain. It's nice to see, always nice to see Cal Penn in the Buffyverse. This, always uh, nice to see Cal Penn's brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, the second appearance of him in the Buffyverse, he's one of the uh, drinking teenagers in Beer Bad. Ooh, headcanon, that's the same guy. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like his recovery from the beer. He's like, I never want to lose my brain again. Extra <laughs> brain! <laughs> um, also, uh, so the guy who plays Marcus Roscoe, the old pervert that uh, swaps bodies with uh, Angel, is uh, Rance Howard who is uh, super famous for being Ron Howard's dad and also for being one of these like in absolutely everything character actors. His uh, IMDb is insane. He's got 281 acting credits. Uh, wow. He passed away in 2017, um, but uh, he has stuff that apparently is still being released. I don't know how that works, um, but uh he was in, uh, dude, he was in Universal Soldier and Small Soldiers. <laughs> wow. Excellent uh, call out on Rance Howard, John. I thought he looked so familiar, but I'm like, he, yeah, you've seen him in everything. Like, he's in, he's in Cool Hand Luke. All right. Uh, let's do best and worst of character look slash work. Our <laughs> most confusing category I've ever figured out. <laughs> Um, so I say, uh, guns, bigotry against demons, not a good look on him. So I'll call that the worst. Uh, but Lorne in his depression bathrobe, that's a good look. Fred has this amazing PTSD, insane Q character that comes out in, uh, Fredless at the end of that, where she, they're, they can't even figure out what this invention does. This thing that I guess throws axes, uh, <laughs> is kind of amazing. And, like, it all comes out in that one minute. They have that prop sitting there for you to think about for quite a while. Yeah. And then when they show how it works, you're like, oh, damn, that's fun. So th- th- the character kind of comes to life and you you see her purpose on the show and, like, how she could be a value. And they do it with a prop, which is exciting, and with, like, a fun, uh, fun set piece. 
uh, of the fighting aliens. I mean, not aliens, bugs. And then the worst character look. Okay, I mean, this is maybe a little bit cruel, but like Angel getting his training on in Sri Lanka where he's beating up all these monks felt just kind of <laughs> unnecessary. And like, <laughs> I, I guess I... I <laughs> I want to see Angel brood a little bit more. The idea that he would just fight his way out of thinking about Buffy, I don't, I don't buy this at all. Uh, it's a fun excuse to have a, to take advantage of a fun set and like to have some cool choreography, but it doesn't do anything to make the character more interesting. Yeah, dealing with Buffy's death all across the board feels like an obligation the show is meeting and not something that they're interested in doing. So like, you know, Buffy dies, Angel has to react to it. Buffy gets resurrected, Angel has to react to it, but they do it all off screen whenever possible and really don't make it important, which is, I don't know, that's probably good because you want it to be its own show, right? Yeah, and it does feel a lot like um, when you're reading like a superhero comic and the, the writer, like the, the, the they really have like this like longer story they want to tell, but they have to fit it into big event stuff. So they're like, all right, in the middle of like, Swamp Thing discovering who he is and stuff. He has to go, like, deal with Infinite Crisis. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just part of being, you know, you're in a shared universe and it's dumb. Well, it's for a big a deal as they make Buffy. I don't buy that this is the path to redemption. And the show doesn't buy it either. That's a really good point, John. Like, the show doesn't believe that it's an important thing that it needs to address. And, you know, they, they do a good job of that by not having Buffy on the show and by keeping the moment between the two shows not on camera, you know, they don't have to spend any time with it. And so it doesn't confuse this beautiful story arc of uh, wonderful characters and moments uh, that would be totally confused and disrupted if Buffy were to appear. Not at all. I There's a great opportunity for them to drop in Buffy. I'm sad they don't. So when Angel gets his training on, he doesn't like, or whatever he's doing, his brood on. They don't get to hit it. Yeah, I think part of that has to do with the logistics of Buffy moving networks this season. Um, oh, they're different networks? So Buffy and Angel are on? Whoa. Yeah, she's on UPN and he's still on the WB. So is there a contractual reason why she can't appear on the show? I don't know. But, I, I really don't know the behind the scenes, but I think that like part of the, the show being so separated in like season six and season three is like because of that. Because, like, if I thought that the only engagement between the two shows, I mean, so far it's just like, oh, Buffy died, like Cordelia says, and then she's like, oh, Willow called Buffy's alive again. (laughs) 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 All right. Um, I totally agree. Best uh, character look is definitely Lauren in his robe. Uh, (laughs) Awesome. Uh, Oh, this is kind of a a little bit of a controversial opinion here, and I'm sorry, hot take, but uh, this particular watch through, um, Fred's performance, Amy Acker's performance as Fred, felt a little bit cartoony and over the top through these seven episodes, whereas she's just like, I'm a little girl, I don't know what's going on. It it just felt like a little bit... uh, like Lilu from Fifth Element, a little, just a little, just a little bit into that direction of just like, I'm smart, but dumb. Um, and I just felt like it was played cartoony and it, it didn't work for me. I know Amy Acker is great. And like, I may, I've seen her in a lot of things, including other episodes of Angel, where I think she's really, really good. But um, it just, it felt like a bit much this particular watch through. Um, but then I had another thought uh, when I was watching the, the intro, um, because uh, my partner, uh, Harriet, she doesn't, particularly care to see angel again because i already made her watch all these episodes once uh but (laughs) she's like that intro theme is so good and she like won't let me skip it because she like you know even though she's not watching she wants to hear it um but i was like watching those them and like all the characters are color coded and uh, angel's blue cordelia's green wesley is yellow gun is orange and fred is purple and i'm like why those colors like i to me those colors don't really fit the characters and then i realized there might be a pattern here so angel is blue because he's the leader and he's broody. Who else Likely is that? Leonardo. Like? <laughs> <laughs> like Leonardo. Okay. And then since Fred is purple, that makes sense because she totally does machines. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the pattern starts to fall apart a little bit. Wesley is yellow. Now, there is no yellow turtle in the, like, you know, canonical four turtles. I looked it up. Apparently, the robot turtle, Metalhead, uh, war yellow. Um, and I actually think this works because uh, we do know that Wesley is, uh, what, what did Gunn call him? English C-3PO? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and then uh, Cordelia is green, which doesn't really map onto anything because there is no turtle that wears green because it would just blend in. It looked like they were naked. Um, and uh, Gun is orange, sort of, which makes him Michelangelo. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's almost like it's almost a pattern there. I would call, yeah, I, I like the turtle the that I would associate Gun most with would be Raphael, not Michelangelo, because he's more hot headed. Yeah, I mean the shade of orange that is on episodes, Guns is it's definitely kind of a, a ruddy, uh, much like Raph, earthy orange. It's not you know, it's not pure orange. I think it, you could call it a red if you really wanted to. Purple, purple for Fred makes perfect sense. That's perfect. yeah. She's definitely the Donatello. <laughs> but but let's let's be real. Who's going to be crazy about pizza? Wesley or Gun? <laughs> <laughs> who's going to be pizza? Fo- who's going to be pizza focused? There uh, nowadays in the comics, there is a turtle who wears a yellow uh, headband. It's um, Yannica, I think. I don't. Yeah, know I came across that pronounced. in my research, but I didn't know anything about her, so I didn't. Uh, but I didn't she's a newly created turtle that was a. Unlike the other turtles, she was originally human and an or- originally a foot soldier. She joins the turtles, and then she almost dies and gets a blood transfusion from Leo, and that's how she becomes a turtle. Um, What's her character like? like? Is I, don't, she, I don't really know. I is she read, like Wesley? I haven't read the comics, but I don't think so. She walks around with Wolverine claws. So uh, Cordelia, I guess, is stuck being the April of the group, right? <laughs> That's a I mean, bummer. she would look she would look amazing in a yellow jumpsuit. Let's oh, all man, let's yeah. all let's all admit that. But she's she's so much not an more... April though. No, Dude, no, but... she's not April. She's so much. She's so different. In the 2012 Ninja Turtles series, um, to kind of bump up the April character, they give her psychic powers. So that's pretty similar to oh, vision powers. Like a like a re, like a like. And the, she starts the to train. Yeah, and she starts to train as a ninja as the series goes on, much like Cordelia is training now. Okay, so like a modern take. Yeah, okay. she's like modern April O'Neil. Yeah, all right. It's hard to feel bad to fit people into like these gender stereotypes, but at least it's better. And than Cordelia Nancy's. is the girl. Yeah, it's <laughs> not great, but yeah. And this has been the nerdiest podcast ever. <laughs> you said it couldn't be done. <laughs> well, we've had one X Files reference, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles extended reference. I'm just waiting for the TNG reference. And then, then we'll be out. Um, so my best work, best worst character look work. Um, so I like the sexual tension for between Cordelia and Angel. Yeah, it's really great work, and it's it's like it occurs like in two different episodes, like when they're training together, and like don't stiffen up on me, and like really kind of strange jokes. Uh, yeah, I don't bend that way. <laughs> And then the whole Chiramption, which is like this great thing. And then, then Moira and Chiramption and, um, and Angel's like, stop saying that. <laughs> um, so, and then of course he, he goes upstairs and he's like, Cordelia, I love you. Well, it, it, there's this whole thing about him saying he loves you. And uh, then he's like flipping out because she says it back, but it's, it's not quite what he wants. But then, so I just, I like that, like their relationship has really changed in like a really impressive way. So I like that. Um, and I feel like Angel's Irish, fake Irish accent has improved on season three, episode one. Like it's it's definitely better than it was season one. Like, which is great. Good, great for David Boreanaz to continue working on that fake Irish accent. I mean, it still sounds terrible, but it, it doesn't sound like high school terrible anymore. Like it, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... Uh, I feel like Angel could be a therapist. Like when he's talking with with uh, uh, um, and Fred, and he's like just like listening. He's being very like his voice is very monotone. He's very you know projecting a lot of like uh, confidence and strength. And like I'm like oh maybe Angel's gonna be a therapist. Um, so I thought that was pretty funny. Oh yes, I did not like how Fred was depicted. That's right, that was the one thing. And so I just don't like this idea. I mean, I just don't like the depiction of Fred's PTSD and depression, like a beautiful mind. I, it just, it's just so unlikely. I mean, that's more like a one in a million depiction. She's writing on walls. That, that's just not a typical depiction of uh, mental illness. Um, it seems so exaggerated and, and like fan, fantasy and like she's, she's super smart and then she's writing all these formulas on the walls and, and John will probably bring up some of these pictures but it's like 
her mental illness is not like some superpower. Um, like it doesn't combine with her natural intelligence to a beautiful mind her way out of this. Um, so mm. I just find it very troubling. Yeah, this is it's good analysis from the both of you guys. <laughs> I'm like, I like Crazy Fred has been my <laughs> call throughout. So thanks for calling me out on that. I mean, so, um, so what mo- the most likely thing is that she'd be up in her room like not doing anything like in a catatonic state or like on her bed, holding her legs together. Um, not like, or like just pacing her room. Like if you want to say like someone who's really ag- like agitated, like how she is and very restless, she'd be pacing, rocking, but she wouldn't be like writing in all the walls. Um, and, uh, and, and sitting underneath tables, uh, not impossible. Nothing's impossible in this world, but it's more likely that she would. She once you remove the trauma, aka being in Pylea for five years, people don't. People can still act. Can still do a lot of activities called activities of daily living. They can still do a lot of those activities once you remove the trauma. Her, she really can't do anything. Like it didn't look like she was showering. Didn't look like she was doing laundry, cleaning. She was very limited in what she was able to do. Wouldn't socialize. And to be frank, it's not like she was traumatized in the setting of Los Angeles. Her trauma was in this alternate demon dimension. So that's not, that's why I don't think it's very realistic. She should have been able to, they should have shown her as more capable than she actually was. But that doesn't lessen her trauma any, any at all. So... Um, that, that I feel would be more realistic depiction. That's a really good point. Cause I mean, you're really right. Like the, the way they set up the character is kind of confusing because you assume she's going to be this genius type character, but then they, de- the way they depict her is kind of incongruent because it is like a magical, what do you call it? Like uh, magical genius kind of depiction of her. And so when it does have a payoff in Fredless, when she, her, you know, crazy, uh, you know, knife, uh, axe throwing weapon works. You're kind of, it's like a wonderful moment of like, oh, that's what Fred's purpose is. Or she can do something because it's like four episodes. And she even says it. She's like, oh, like I'm freeloading, you know, at Angel's Hotel or whatever. Like she calls out all the things that are wrong with what she's doing. Um, but it's so unexpected to actually have a payoff. Like when they get, when she's leaving the show, even like saying goodbye to people, you're like, oh, maybe she's gone, but she's in the credits. So I'm like, I made a note, like she's definitely coming back because I <laughs> didn't assume that they would, uh, get, you know, boot her from the show so soon without figuring out a reason for her to be there. But the reason is like the most obvious reason that was there all along, which is like, oh, she's this magical genius character. But like the the depression they depict her having is like so challenging, right? You're so right because it's like it should be a lot, uh, a lot less active, <laughs> a lot less of like doing the same thing she did in the cave, but doing it in a hotel room. Like it should be a lot less of a person. Um, anyway, it's, it's a confusing character. That's a little bit immature in the way it's presented. That's a, those are the cartoon read. And you know, your readers so right about, you can't have cartoon, your cartoon depression doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. I think I've always, um, like it never has come close enough to reality to trigger anything for me. Cause like, I know what depictions of like mental illness, like in real life, look like you know some mental illness look like, and this has never felt real enough to me to be like uncomfortable. So that's why I've always just been like, I like it; it's funny. But it's for the same reasons that you guys are like, this is inaccurate and (laughs) problematic. I'm like, it's so inaccurate, I don't think about it; I just enjoy it. Yeah, (laughs) like a cartoon. Yeah, like a good cartoon. Oh man. Except that time my brother was killed by a piano. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a tune. Uh, is that from, and his is voice that from sounded Roger? just like this. Is that that's from Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yeah. Okay. There is your brother. He looks like an interesting and sober fellow. Uh, let's do uh, best and worst new character. Um. I said Fred's parents. I I liked them. Uh, I like the thing of like they look suspicious and stuff, but they are appropriately suspicious of Angel Investigations, where they're like, 
are they hiding Fred from us? Like, what is, <laughs> yeah. what is this weird investigation? And they're clearly lying about movie stuff. <laughs> they're very reasonably suspicious. I like how everyone was a, was an extra in a monster movie, except Lauren, who's like, like Lauren makes monster movies with Angel. And she just goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like Gavin Park. He's really fun. I like that somebody has a completely different angle for how to go take down Angel Investigates, right? Or Investigations. And that his thing is like bringing up all the code violations of the hotel. And like the fact that like he's doing it straight face, just like you guys got some code violations and they're, they're losing their shit. Like they don't, (laughs) they actually have no tools to deal with that problem of this expensive, crazy hotel that they're living in. And like, I'm just, I've been waiting for them to bring this stuff up for so long of like, you can't just squat in a place and make it yours, right? And like, just there's got to be some burden of having a massive property that's not used (laughs) for any, has no commercial use. And so like, I'm so thankful that someone brought it up. And so like, I'm on Gavin's side. And then when Lila's like, huh, yeah, like you're really taking on Angel. Like, what the fuck are you doing, Lila? Like... (laughs) So Gavin Park's great. Plus he was on Lost, so I recognized him. And there's so few characters I recognize from shows because I only watch mainstream shows. But anyway, <laughs> that's not true. But uh, yeah, he he's great. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's do uh, John's segment, which is best zoom in and enhance opportunities. Well, there's not a lot. So as people know, uh, Angel has never been released in HD, so it doesn't have the uh, treasure trove of uh, objects that uh, you can zoom in on when you watch Buffy in HD. Um, But uh, I have spent a lot of time trying to zoom in on uh, Fred's walls to see what she's been writing. Um, Some of it you can make out. uh, Most of it you can't, because not only is it shot, uh, you know, or or not shot, but not only is it in SD when you watch it, but also, like, it's shot with... uh, Usually with a pretty shallow depth of field compared to Buffy, Angel is just like part of the look of the show. Um, so like the walls are almost always out of focus. But there are a few things that you can make out. Um, I've taken a lot of screenshots. Um, things that Amy has written on her... Not Amy. Her name's not Amy. The things that Fred has written on her walls <laughs> are... Uh, go away. Go away. Knocking is one. She wrote, In theory, things are possible. But in reality, things don't work. She wrote, um, this is my, one of my favorites. She wrote, there is no model for reason, time, space, and plexiglass. That's a good <laughs> that one. That is good. Uh, let's see. Uh, listen, the knocking starts. Which is a bit ominous. Um, yeah, that sounds very like um, Firefly. Like. Yeah. However, if one assumes that the electron is a point charge, uh, and then in parentheses, R0 equals zero, the mass of the electron field surrounding it becomes infinite! Exclamation point. Uh, and then there's a lot of things that you can't make out. So that's, that's, uh, that's Fred's walls. Too wow, cool. I thought there'd be so much more. <laughs> I know. I was hoping to as well, but it's just you can't read it. If they ever do release it uh, in HD, there might be more we can get out of there. There's like delicious paragraphs of text that you just can't read. And I, I don't have a zoom in and enhance, but I noticed the picture of Winston Churchill in um, in uh, Wesley's office. That's nice. nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's do recommendations. Recommendations. Um, looks like John has some this week. Do you want to do it first? Uh, yeah, just definitely because uh, Angel recommends them. Uh, <laughs> Omega Man and Soylent Green. I don't know. He probably already recommended both those films at some point. But, we might not uh, have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Soylent Green is like a super underrated movie. Like people think it's a twist movie, but the like so-called twist is like not what makes that movie good. I'm not going to spoil it here just in case somebody hasn't seen the Saturday Night Live sketch or like doesn't know what the (laughs) joke is about that film but it's actually a really good uh kind of post-apocalyptic movie and there's a really heart-rending scene where this old man weeps because like nobody in the younger generation remembers what nature was like and it's actually like really poignant and uh good it's a good movie 
Uh, and then also I want to recommend Alien Resurrection for like the 18th time because uh, it's underrated. I don't care what uh, Fred's parents think. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so here are my recommendations. Um, so I was thinking about how at the beginning there was that fight with the monk demons and the like fight choreography in that and how we were like suddenly into wire work on Angel. And I was like, what is appropriate to talk about with that? Well, how about uh, Chinese vampire movies with the hopping vampires? So uh, I'm going to recommend um, Mr. Vampire and Encounters of the Spooky Kind. Uh, uh, I actually, it's been so long since I've seen Mr. Vampire, I don't remember it very well. But I remember Encounters of the Spooky Kind re- really good. well. It's a Sammo Hung comedy uh, vampire uh, wirework movie. Super fun. Um, so that's what I was thinking about with those. Um, and then I was thinking about the kind of hostage situation of um, that old gang of mine. And the one thing <laughs> that mo- usually a, a hostage situation movie does is like it gets like the hostages and the guys taking the people doing the hostage taking to like interact and to like learn about each other or something. And that's not what that old gang of mine does. <laughs> um, but I still was like, I really like, you know, I mean, you got to recommend Dog Day Afternoon if you're doing that kind of thing. And then I was also thinking about Key Largo, which is the Bogan Bacall movie where they're trapped in a hotel. Uh, so that, one, that one's interesting. Um, I'm recommending Drifting Classroom because I just saw watched it with this this week with these guys. And because there's bug monsters in that that's very similar to Fredless are very cool looking, but they have to do a lot of work to shoot around how much they don't exactly work on screen. Uh <laughs> And I think Drifting Classroom does it in a more psychedelic way. Um, and then I was thinking about uh, Wesley as the misogynist slasher. Um, so I was thinking about movies where the killer has a drill. And so the Driller Killer and Slumber Party Massacre are kind of different sides of the same coin of the misogynist killer. Because, um, like, you know, Slumber Party Massacre is, like, almost a, it, you know, ah. I don't want to get too much into it because I'm not going to talk about like gender theory and slasher. Cause that's like something I'd have to actually do research for. And like people on the <laughs> internet would complain if I did it wrong, but those, eh, those are my wrecks. That's what I'm doing. I'm not getting that heavy with, with it. All right. Uh, let's do, let's uh, move into the rant section guys. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Billy a little bit. Um, Maybe we'll get a little bit heavy with it, unfortunately. Um, oh, yeah. You guys can. I just don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, you know, Billy is this weird episode where the monster is this guy who um, brings out the misogynist within you and turns you into, like, this weird killer. And um, it's just one of the things the episode is playing with, not that deftly, but one of the things the episode is playing with is this question of, is like, you know, is you know, misogyny or is, is that something that comes from within the person or is that something that is applied to them? Right. It's the sort of like, uh, you know, children aren't born knowing how to hate sort of question or thought. Uh, and what's interesting to me about it is that they, they, the, the episode kind of talks about it both ways. Uh, on the one hand, um, they keep saying that like, Oh, he brings this out in the men around him. And sort of there's this suspicion that like all men have, uh, this woman hating tendency that's like that they're holding back constantly. Yeah. Uh, I think they even call it like primeval or something. Yeah, like, exactly. Well, and that, that certainly is like borne out with the way that Wesley goes. Cause he immediately goes biblical with it. He's like, it's been this way since Eve. And it's just like <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, but then uh, at the end, Wesley like blames himself for it because he did things. Uh, and uh, he, you know, has this crazy idea that he should maybe feel responsible for the things that he's done. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Fred comes in and says, oh, it's not, don't worry, it's not you. This was something that was sort of done to you and applied to you. And I think it's an interesting, interesting question, like or an interesting uh, way to think about this, because it's both like, in, like literally both things are true, right? It's, it is on the one hand true that toxic masculinity is something that we didn't ask to be born into. It's not something we asked to be raised with. Um, but on the other hand, it also gets in you and lives in you. And, uh, you know, I think the thing that I is like kind of where the episode leaves off is a little bit weird. It's sort of a half ending because uh, um, Fred sort of basically says, because 
because you it was applied to you and not something that came from inside of you, you're not really responsible for it. And I don't hold you accountable for the things that you did, which I think is maybe a problematic thing, piece of reasoning. Like, like as long as it's magical, it works. But like if you take it into the real world, like it doesn't work. Like you're not responsible because it's a, a you know something that's in your culture is is not something we can do. We can't we can't use that. So speaking that of was like, what I that's what I like thought about bringing it into the real world, like but not in a misogynist way uh uh this episode really made me think about because we're living in quarantine times like proper ha- like oh yeah <laughs> like people just keep getting infected because they don't know how to maintain proper social distance <laughs> <laughs> like wes and gun just touch blood like, yeah they're just like oh some blood yeah <laughs> gun freaking saw That's bloody handprint and touched it like what the hell gun <laughs> it's like yeah it's like oh touch it oh still wet it must be fresh um, John, just just to piggyback on what you said i something i hadn't thought about was um like the misogyny was like really heteronormative misogyny like it was uh it was interesting it was all it was all just i don't know it, it was interesting all the characters were straight all the all the all the anger was towards women but it's not as if you know it, so it's very kind of limited in that sense it's also Angel said, like, he let go of his anger. Does that mean that, like, Wesley yeah, that's weird, not? too. That's super weird. I don't, yeah, this idea that, like, yeah, that that's coming out of what they're calling hatred, which is something that Angelus doesn't have, which is, I don't buy. <laughs> it's a weird twisting of words that doesn't quite work for me. Yeah. Although I'd, I'd buy the idea that, like, a guy who's been around for, like, over 200 years just doesn't have the same issues that everybody else has because he's yeah. been through it and out. it's out of totally out of his system. And he, but Which is also why he should not date a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> that ties back to that. I, I, feel like, I feel like Wesley was possibly ov- overly sensitive about, like, coming back to work also oh this one thing I, uh, uh, remind me about this in a second like he, he I, obviously they wanted to show that he was guilt that he still felt guilty probably maybe they were trying to indicate that he still had similar feelings that were always beneath the surface i wasn't quite sure if like he he was he felt extra guilty because he's had those feelings before and he's always been able to repress them um you know it's still just embarrassing to go you know frankly psycho uh, in front of your, someone you like or in front of like a normal person and you know your friend like going psycho is embarrassing but the way they treated it it was like he had extra guilt right um we didn't we did not talk about the traumatic brain injuries the tbis oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> gun gets really yeah, just... really clocked <laughs> so so gun got tbi'd and then um, <laughs> tbi'd Love it. And then Wesley got TBI'd when he fell through that, that, that floor. But it's like, like you can, you're per, you can have a lot of symptoms from a traumatic brain injury. Like, I feel like go, even going back to work after like three to four days, like, no, you really should go back to work after that short period of time. Like, and he's like, you know, I just, I just thought that I'm like, dude, Wesley needs like a couple more weeks. Okay. Like, <laughs> like, even if he didn't go absolutely freaking psycho, he got he got really knocked out. Like, really, like soft skull, like got knocked out. And so did Gun. And like, man, that's just crazy. Like the amount of like head trauma, it's so crazy. Uh, Mike, do you want to go into your uh, rant? Yeah, just um, Darla's search for a super late term abortion um, is crazy, and. I, and I just got to draw attention to it because it's like the end of episode for the couple episodes even we're supposed to be concerned about Darla as a looming bad baddie, you know, kind of and, and what might happen next. And like she's hanging out at bars. She goes to Central America to try and like find a shaman who can deal with the problem. And like she is so super pregnant like she's got a small frame. And so like you just see this massive like she it's the fact that she's looking for a solution now, and it's not like the show's like showing her like gradually like bumping out, like she's full bump. Like, and it looks like she could have a baby any second (laughs) uh, for every time she's on screen. And so when they, they show that central America moment, like, Oh, I'm like, I like, it just registered me that she was thinking about getting an abortion or trying to figure out what to, how to deal with this. And it's like, girl, it is too late. (laughs) <laughs> what are you up? I, I don't know much about this whole process, but I know that this is too late. And that just like 
made me feel insane. I get she's a vampire, whatever. So that's that rant. Anyway. How did you feel? How did you feel when Cordelia was talking about her supernatural pregnancy? Oh, that was amazing when she was relating to her about what it was going to be like. <laughs> I mean, that whole scene's great because Cordelia is punishing Angel for like not being immediately empathetic to Darla, and then fucking gets you know attacked by Darla when she's alone with her. Like, no one can trust this woman. All right, this rant is from the, oh gosh, that gang of mine. Man, when they killed Merle, I was so sad. Merle's such a, a likable loser. <laughs> and, like, they went after just the weakest uh, the weakest villain. And I, I that made me, like, of course, I'm concerned about, you know, this, this gang episode. But, like, that made me just really sad. I just had an emotional reaction to it, of Merle being killed. But uh, I guess we need to talk about gang of mine for just a second. So, like... Gang of Mine is really simple and really obnoxious at the same time. And like, I've only seen this once. And so I, when you were going into, you know, some deeper discussion on Billy, I felt a little of guilt and anxiety because I'm like, oh shit. Like I, I saw all this stuff happening in that episode, but I couldn't articulate anything that was happening. I was just like, this is too much. I need to rewatch this four times. Uh, this episode's super fucked up. <laughs> that Gang of Mine had triggers like that for me too, where I'm like, okay, this is diving into really obvious racist issues here. Uh, and it's more complicated. So I just want to bring up surface level stuff that I saw that I was like, okay, so the gang, which is an urban gang of mostly, uh, mostly black people who is taking on demons indiscriminately because they have no empathy for demons, period. So they're able to kill Merle and like the Slurpee demon and just like these nice guy demons because they're demons. So they have a real simple black and white perspective. Meanwhile, because they're black, we assume they have a more nuanced perspective uh, about demons. And we're seeing, you know, Angel and Gunn on their side, like, uh, you know, there's a conflict because, you know, Gunn is like, why do we care about Merle? Why would we investigate this murder? Like, it doesn't matter. And Angel is like, and Wesley like, dude, go home. <laughs> You're not ready for this. Like, he's imp- he is an important person. Not every demon is bad. Um, and... That seems like so simple and nuanced, but they take it to such a weird extreme in destroying Caritas. And like, I have an emotional investment in Caritas. And like, I didn't know I did until they destroyed it. And I like, I was so angry at that gang. Like I wanted them all obliterated <laughs> for their destruction of what is essentially a haven. But of course they don't recognize it, right? And so that that episode builds to the destruction of Caritas. Now, there's a lot more going on in, in those scenes in that episode, but they are so it's just a poor assembly of ideas that it just like it both hits you over the head and then gives you nothing to grasp onto so like i'm super confused by that episode is where i end up just like as i think through it i could watch it a few more times but in my initial read i'm like i don't know what their i don't know what their statement is except for the obvious like their contrast john you're nodding <laughs> i just agree with you I, yeah it 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 doesn't it seems like some what might be good ideas that have not been thought through uh it's like um it's it's just they they want a show that um for the most part focuses on all, all white characters then wants to bring in villains to show how bad you know prejudice is and brings in an all a, a cast that's all people of color to be the villains to show how bad prejudice is i mean i don't know maybe that could be do, what done well if it was done carefully or thoughtfully but it really if, feels like it yeah. isn't <laughs> I yeah, I always like a good like not all humans are good and not all demons are bad episode. Like that's yeah. like my bread and butter for the sh- for these shows. Right. Um uh it's an issue when they like they have gun as a character and then they like never spend any time with gun and the rest like the yeah. show is separated gun from his old gang, right? So we only see them when they're causing trouble. Um so it would be better if we like you know, if we did spend more time with them outside of them being like <laughs> out on a rampage, or if or like <laughs> the gang that attacked Caritas was not a gang, like you know, I don't know. Yeah, or we there's so many ways it could have been done differently to, but like I think it. But it I, helps. I do. I really like the stuff of like, um, like they're not only just attacking, like they're attacking so indiscriminately that like sometimes they are attacking like demons who are actually evil like they're like this thing is a baby eater but they're like lumping that in with like soft big gulp boy you know um uh so i think th- those are really interesting like moments 
that are worth exploring uh and that's why i like rate it as a high episode but um yeah i think it's like it's almost like it's it's too much too many ideas for an hour of television for 45 minutes of television well too many ideas to like kind of skim the surface on like they need to go deeper on the on the subtle differences between demons i mean we have so much empathy with the demons they're attacking already that they don't have to build it and do they build empathy at the end does the gang change their mind like no that's i think the where it really fails is like the whole gang doesn't change like if anything gun like changes more on the side of the ga- on his old gang than like merges into a like we can be friends territory you know um but like usually in like these hostage situation things we get some sort of mutual bonding right because at the time you know we get the uh what's the name of that syndrome the like stockholm yeah we get there's like no stockholming going on at all man i mean it would have been interesting if the gang changed their mind and like felt genuinely like apologized or like but there's it doesn't really turn that way and now i'm confused i'm like i don't even remember how this ends now jeez because i'm sure it just gets resolved <laughs> uh by beating people up um and then I emotionally reacted, moving on here, sorry. I emotionally reacted to Angel telling Cordelia he loved her flippantly in that scene. Um, and like everyone saying like, we love you, Angel, just like really casually. Uh, it was really sweet. And like it got me with um, how they handled that. That was just like a really slick handling of a complicated relationship that was building. And, you know, Travis already talked to the uh, the sexual tension building between Cordelia and Angel that's immediately diffused when Darla shows up. But before Darla shows up, um, you know, we have this really nice, like, interesting character build where Cordelia is, uh, you know, training with Angel. And, like, uh, there's something that's building there that feels really, really, like, well well pulled off. Like, it feels genuine. It's interesting. And uh, that and Angel just exploring the idea that maybe he loves Cordelia. And, like, in just that when Angel isn't and sure of him, isn't sure of himself, like that's like top level Boreanaz acting there. Like that's probably one of the best scenes for him to act in, which is like, I am going to as casually as possible, try and talk about something that I'm not sure if I want it to exist slash there's something here. And I love that exploration. That scene's so good. And it works emotionally so well. Yeah. I also like that. It's like it, the pretty much the minute he becomes aware that it exists, he's like, "I'm gonna go talk about it." Instead of like, I'm "Oh yeah," because gonna... he could have held onto that for <laughs> five more episodes, right? Oh. Yeah. But they already just is satisfying because, like, you know, how often it shows is it the other way, right? Just like, oh, I'm aware of something, I'll go talk. About, I'll actually talk about it. <laughs> right when just a few episodes before, like, there's this Fred Angel thing where she's obsessed with him, and he's like, doesn't even want to deal with it. It's, like, not his problem. Um, okay, and then let's just talk about the Lila Angel fan service. Okay, what <laughs> the fuck is this scene? Um, I, didn't, I didn't know that we were even going to go there, um, but the Lila Angel scene, which, you know, gets set up because Marcus is in his body, whatever, and, like, they can explore that. Like, the fact that Lila's ready to go is crazy. <laughs> like, I, I did not expect that from her. And I think this scene is like disrupted my brain. And we, we all, there's a lot going on in this scene that if we were going to rewatch it, but like, I think it's ultimately it's just fan service and like, it's fun to explore these kinds of relationships and the, you know, the writers of Buffy and Angel know that we enjoy seeing these topsy turvy things happening, but like that was, uh, that was a messy scene. And then he bites <laughs> too. And she runs off, but like, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> uh, but at the same time, like, I there's something really there's something really real and present about that scene which is that you know by having a horny random horny man inhabit your body like you're always this you can always connect to the character of random horny man regardless of where you are like the stakes have been set up between Lila and Angel a long time ago this should never happen but you're always a old horny man so like why not go for it so like there's something that's kind of real about it that like like in a horror film when suddenly someone pulls a gun on somebody and they're supposedly friends you're like oh shit and at any moment i guess that could happen so like at any moment characters could just make out if there's no one in the room to du- judge judge them <laughs> and like i that reality is disturbing to me but the show explored it in a weird way where it's like people could just have sex and why not let's do it and like 
anyway, fan service scene, but I'm like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Stop this. <laughs> I bet that was cut into the uh, next time on Angel. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, what a hook that would be. That'd be like the Angel and Buffy are getting married. <laughs> <laughs> oh it would be like hey angel buffy's still alive makes out with lila <laughs> maybe him him and a, him being with a brunette is not uh, so unnatural uh since he's like cordelia now well but um, cordelia's putting blonde highlights in nowadays right that, that, that's that's true, the only cause... reason this works <laughs> <laughs> um so uh, two things. Uh, my rant is like I, I really enjoy Fred's like to, how Fred thinks about reality, where um, she's able to really car- compartmentalize the things that happen to her, and and maybe it's that she she she's dealing with the she's dealing with the trauma of Pylea, and at where she is in life, she can only deal with that dra- that 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 trauma when she compartmentalizes it. And then if, if her world expands to what it was once was, that, that trauma kind of overloads her senses. So maybe that's kind of what, what like, uh, the writers are trying to say. But I really, I really, really love that interpretation um, of, dealing, of dealing with trauma. Like, I think that's a great, that's a great reason why, why you know, she didn't call her, or why she sent that, that letter that was on unmarked or whatever without a return address and why she wanted to avoid her parents like that to me feels very real like of all the unreal things that happened in Fredless that seems like really emotionally true Um, so I really enjoyed that and then my other uh, thing that was I don't even know what to do about this but it's Lila Morgan's like how, how Lila Morgan deals with the consequences in Billy when she's like choked out by Gavin Park and Cordelia shows up and she's like, I'm not like Lindsay. I know the risks of my job. And it's just like, Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I like how all this is. Um, like I, I, I don't, I don't know what happened to Gavin Park after that. Like, ah, oh, man, that just seems, I don't know. That one's, that one's just rough. And then she just murders Billy at the end, which you want to be rooting for, but she's like pretty unsympathetic up until that point. Eh, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm like super... I like how she calls out Lindsay for being kind of a wuss, which she totally was, um, and how she she knows like the stakes. Is, and maybe she's more evil than Wesley, or more evil than Lindsay perhaps. But um, I don't know. Like that's a... That's like a real... I'm not sure how to feel about her depiction in, in, in the episode Billy. I think you're right. I think it's a, it's like not very satisfying. It's not a satisfying, like, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird episode. I mean, they'd spent so much time making Billy important and then for have her dispatch him like that, you know, without, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's not as satisfying because that episode's, it's such a confusing episode. So it's, it's like, as again, like it's a complicated idea that's strangely handled. Like yeah. to me, that, that, that should be like a Lila Morgan centric episode. Like to mm. me. Yeah. Like, I feel like we should see her get revenge on Gavin or, Ga- yeah, Gavin Park. Like, we should see her hunt down this guy. Like, I don't know. I mean, give her, like, you know, because it feels like there's no Lila Morgan episode. Like, Lindsay, Lindsay had, like, a bunch of Lindsay episodes, right? Yeah. But I mean, we I, don't really have a Lila episode. I mean, that's sort of the running theme of these seven episodes, right? So, like, one of the things we were talking about, uh, I think, a lot of times was that, uh, you know, it's refreshing to watch... Uh, early Buffy and Angel because it's episodic television, which is nice because they get to try out a lot of ideas and, you know, not every idea has to be a massive world-ending arc. Yeah. And here we're seeing sort of the downside of that, which is that there's a lot of underexplored ideas. Uh, and that gang of mine, I think, suffers from being underexplored. Uh, like, we need to know more about those characters for it to work. Uh, Billy is an underexplored idea. Lila's arc in Billy is, like, really, really underexplored. Um, and, like, for me, like, I could definitely use, like, an entire season of angel trapped in an old man's body just trying to escape and having adventures trying to escape from the old folks home that would be an amazing show Uh, i would not not watch that (laughs) i I would watch that that would be fun meet my granddaughter i'm in a hurry (laughs) yeah i i don't know i mean at least angel's doing big ideas even if they're not like fully realized yeah and i think i'd rather have this version 
yeah. absolutely better this version where you have like too many ideas that you know like too many good ideas really as opposed to some star trek cards i could name which is like one idea way over explored <laughs> You know, that's what happens when a novel, a novelist becomes a showrunner. Um, yeah. Uh, my rant is not as, like, deep as any of you guys's. Uh, I just, I wanted to talk for a minute about the fight choreography this season. Because uh, what has happened is, like, they've moved on to wire to, to the wire foo. And they've really spent a lot more, like, money and effort on this fight choreography. Which you can really tell. But, like John pointed out in What's More Worth Feeling. Um, where it's, like, there's this disparity between the super skilled singers and the non-skilled singers um there's a disparity between the monsters that are fighting who are stuntmen who really know how to use this and then the main actors who who, (laughs) when they're wired up their bodies just don't know what to do with it so david boreanis at this point in his career really didn't know what to do with the wire foo so like like in that opening scene of the series of the season where he's fighting all those monks it's like he d- is so unbelievable doing all that crazy martial arts and spinning. And then you see his like big heavy body being dragged by the wires. <laughs> um, and the same thing happens with Wes and Gunn when they fight the like uh, old Chinese couple who turn out to be like martial arts demons. And they're doing all these spinning and stuff. And <laughs> Wes and Gunn are just like, ah, just try to axe it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's my rant. That's all I got. Dude, I love the term wire foo. It immediately makes sense. I'd never heard it. Love it. Uh, oh, and um, I mean, I guess it's a rant. This is a good place to put it. Uh, just recently for us, but six months ago for you guys, um, uh, Jay August Richards uh, just came out as gay. Uh, so shout out to him. Congratulations on uh, coming out. We had, as a fan, I had no idea until this week. Um so yeah good for you living your best life all right let's move on to predictions virgin predictions at the this moment you are at an overall accuracy of 62.69 percent Let's uh, see what we can do with these seven episodes we just watched. Actually, surprisingly few uh, predictions, I think, have been confirmed or denied, uh, even though we watched seven episodes. Uh, In Buffy, season four, episode eight, you predicted, Michael, no more vampires will be killed by direct sunlight unless it's a trap. So... (laughs) Um, the oh, what's gosh. his name? The vampire who has his heart taken out. He um, throws his vampire buddy into the sun. Yeah, James. And right. Yeah. It's really. I watched the watched that scene a couple times to see if I could glean like whether or not he knew he was going to do that at the start of the scene, thus making it a trap, right? But I think it's not. I think I think he decides on spur of the moment to throw his friend into the sunlight because he doesn't like what he told him. It's basically it's based on what the information he got out of the conversation that he does that. So I think that that, that one's denied. Does anybody have any uh, thoughts or pushback on that? It's a denial. Okay. All right. So that's denied. The last time, everything else is from the last time we watched Angel, which was uh, the end of season two. Uh, Michael, you predicted that Fred will join Angel Investigations in season three. And so she has. So that's confirmed. You guys only talk about Amy Acker enough for me to assume that she would be important. So. <laughs> oh, no, uh, we gave something away. Slight, slight, slight spoiler alert on that, huh? And then you also, in that same one, predicted Wolfram and Hart operates in even more dimensions in season three. So Wolfram and Hart, I think, are operating in another dimension uh, when they go and send Angel to rescue mm-hmm. uh, rescue Billy from the, the skip dimension. So I think that that counts uh, right oh, there. Oh, I have one here. Okay, sorry. so really quickly, sorry. Yeah, yeah so uh, we're going to confirm, I think, that uh, mm-hmm. Wolfram and Hart operate in even more dimensions in Season 3. Uh, Dennis, what have you got? Uh, Angel, Season 2, Part 1. Angel will not investigate the source of vampires uh, because uh, the old man in Angel's body does some research about vampires. <laughs> He's trying to figure out what <laughs> vampires are. But that's so not I, Angel doing it. <laughs> it's Angel's body. Everybody thinks it's Angel. Prove to me that's not Angel. 
Uh, I think that that one stays open, Dennis. Uh, nice try. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, I believe, two confirms, uh, one denial, thus uh, taking you up from a 62.69 to a 62.72. Well, I got some new predictions here. Um, I believe that Darla and Angel will team up to fight Holtz. That feels inevitable after the end of uh, that last episode there. Um, offspring. Um, I, I, Kate is missing from all these episodes. So, I, I, guys, I, I'm sad, but Angel and Kate is never going to happen. I know it's a never, which is a mistake, but, like, it's never going to happen. Um, Cordelia is going to have a badass fight moment in season five. We're clearly building up to some kind of badass fight moment where she saves Angel, saves the gang, whatever. I don't know what it's going to look like, but she's going to have a badass moment. You're predicting uh, season five. Yeah, I think in season five, yeah. I mean, we got plenty of episodes left. Oh, season five, sorry. I meant season three. Sorry, my brain, uh, I don't know where I am. My name is Michael Poli. I am in season <laughs> three of Angel. Uh, sorry. Um, Gunn is going to have a Michelangelo moment in season three. <laughs> where he's going to say cowabunga and or be overexcited about pizza. <laughs> We're building up a Michelangelo character. I'm excited. And then my super prediction. From Raphael to Michelangelo. <laughs> uh, Fred's formulas are going to be used for time travel. We're doing a lot of dimensional travel really casually. So we got to up the ante time travel with Fred's formulas. Yeah, and I just I mean still, Fred. I I I should just say Fred is. Do you guys know what I mean? You guys are gonna hurt me if I. <laughs> so Fred is. We're not gonna uh, hurt you. We're, you make it sound like an abusive podcast. No, 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 no. We they will hurt you, Mike. Okay, Fred. You need to be super vague. You need to be vague. I need to be more vague. Fred. It only hurts if you're attached to these things. Hold on, I'm gonna remove Fred from this. Like will, Angel melting your eyes really hurt you if it's just to your Angel D&D investigations. Characters. Angel investigations will time travel i think you've predicted that like three times but <laughs> uh let me make sure angel will travel through time yeah i did predict that angels uh, <laughs> season two part two i also had a few f- no 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 that's so so work on a different fred based prediction fred is going to develop a formula to fit to Undo time travel. Undo time travel. Boom. Undo it. Undo it. Uh, time travel. Right? Because it'll be a demon that'll cause time travel and then she'll fix it. Cool. It, it is so funny to look through these predictions. Sorry. It is so funny to look through these predictions <laughs> and be like, what has Mike predicted multiple times? Angel will kill Darla <laughs> multiple times. Angel will not become a human again multiple times. Um. We just we let it happen, so it's fine. I mean, there's this Groundhog Day kind of thing happening when uh, you do this podcast, and yeah. you, your brain just my brain loops around certain ideas that are repeated in the show. Yeah, that the show Charlotte... is all about shan chewing. So, <laughs> all right, uh, is that it, guys? Have we said everything we need to say about these seven episodes of Angel? I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I've been uh, your host, Dennis St. John. Uh, I'm online at Dennis Comics. That's D-E-N-I-S-C-O-M-I-X. Dennis with one N, comics with an X. Uh, That is my Twitter, my Instagram, and my dot com. And you can find the rest of us and everything we do about Buffy and Angel on uh, BuffyVirgin.com. Buffy uh, Virgin Pod is our Instagram. Our Twitter is Buffy Virgin. Uh, rate us, review us, subscribe from us to su- subscribe to us. Uh, does anyone else have anything out they're doing? Uh, all right. Well, it's been lovely talking to you guys again, and uh, we'll see you in hell. <laughs>